Welcome to Game Brigade. I'm your host Brian and today on the show we're going to be taking a look at Outer Rim by Fantasy Flight Games. Stay tuned for my review. Welcome back to Game Brigade. I'm your host, Brian, and on this show, we do reviews, previews, and playthroughs of your favorite games. So if that interests you, please consider subscribing. Today, we're going to be taking a look at Outer Rim. This is a one to four player uh, delivery, pickup and delivery game. Also, it's kind of a sandboxy game brought to you by Fantasy Flight Games set in the Star Wars universe. So I've had this game for about six months now. And I've gotten quite a few plays through it, and I feel like I I want to express to my friends here on the channel um, how much I enjoyed this game. While not without its flaws, I think this is a very thematic uh, experience, especially if you're someone like me who loves the Star Wars universe. So, we're going to talk about the gameplay, how does the game work, and then we'll talk about you know each section breaking it down little by little. So the gameplay breaks down to each character selecting uh, a hero or villain from the Star Wars universe. All the characters are going to be characters that aren't aligned with like the Force or the Empire. They're mostly gonna be smugglers or bounty hunters or riffraff. So you're not gonna get anyone that's like Luke Skywalker or anything like that. All the characters are, um, are just like I said, they're smugglers. Now, what I do appreciate is that this is set in the uh, Galactic Civil War era, so no First Order, no stuff that's you know, you know, non-movie stuff. Most of the stuff is canon, uh, current canon. There are some characters taken from some of the cartoons, like Rebels and whatnot. So if you're not familiar with some of the uh, newer shows, you might not know every character. But generally, most of the stuff is relatively well known. So the way the game works is you're going to have your character. So here I have Han Solo selected as my character. And you're going to have your dashboard here. On the dashboard, you can see that we have a ship as well as this uh, chart here that has quite a bit of different uh, designs on it. So we're going to move from top to bottom and kind of explain what the game is and how these charts read. So the, tar the top chart here is the fame level. And that's actually the goal of this game is to reach 10 fame in the galaxy to win. Personally, I like to play the 12. You can see the chart does go up to 12 to en enable longer games. That's what I, I like in this type of a game. But the goal standardly is 10. They say for new players to try to six to get, get used to the mechanics of the game. Um, but generally I find by the time you get to six, that's when the game actually starts getting fun. Directly below that we have our character card. Now character card will have your damage as well as how much health you have for ground combat. You'll also see any special uh, abilities you may have or passive abilities. So Han Solo gives plus two to ship movement. And then below that is your personal goal. Every character is gonna have a personal goal that they're gonna wanna complete to you know, meet the thematic reasons of what that character likes to do. Han Solo, for example, wants to get a ship that's valued at fifteen thousand dollars or more. I mean, that's Han Solo, right? He wants he wants a, a sick ride. So, once you reach your personal goal, Han Solo or your whatever character card you have will flip, and there will be a different ability on there now because he is, you know, maintain that goal. Usually, that also increases your fame because. Uh, whatever you know whatever reason it increases your fame generally when you flip your your card now we have a generic ship out here because as if we're starting a game but the ships beyond the starter ships also will have a personal goal that you can complete which can increase your fame as well by completing those personal goals to the left here we have the faction uh, reputation sliders we have the rebellion the empire the syndicate and the huts i have defaulted this one to the starting reputation for Han Solo. So he is neutral with everyone and he is negative with the huts. Makes sense. I mean, Jabba the Hutt is not very happy with him right now. Additionally, we have sections up here at the top for gear. 
and we have sections in the bottom for jobs or bounties. You will slide cards in there to fulfill those slots to say you what kind of gear you have or any type of job or bounty you have. Uh, also on the side here we have our ship. You'll see it's got a mod slot, a cargo slot, and a crew slot. We also have a speed, a damage, and a robustness or how much health your ship has. Now these starting ships are two-sided. So on the alternative side, we have a faster ship, but it deals less damage and has less hull. So depending on how you want to play your game, when you start the game, you choose each other ship uh, of which one you want to start with. And Han Solo starts with a piece of cargo telling him where he needs to deliver it. So that's the rundown of how the character card works. Let's talk about how the actual gameplay works, and then we can talk about how everything kind of flows together. So the point of this game is, as I said, to get to 10 fame. To get to 10 fame, you're gonna to have to complete jobs or bounties or deliver illicit cargo to different sections of the, the galaxy. So what you'll do is you'll have your character and you have your planning step, your action step, and your encounter step. In the planning step, you can choose if you wanna stay on the planet, do some odd jobs, help some moisture farmers, and collect 2,000 coins. You can also recover any damage you've sustained. If you were defeated, so if you had lost all your health, you are required to actually plan, uh, recover your health in the planning step. So if you ever def get defeated or die, you, you, know, you drop your character over, the next turn you have to spend your turn healing. Uh, the final thing that you can do in the planning step is actually move. When you move, there are little waypoint blips that indicate how many spots that movement is. So Han Solo is going to move. We're just going to go over to now Hutta here because he can, he can fly really fast. In the action step, we have several options we can do. We can deliver any cargo or bounties that we've had. We can also sh uh, shop the market. And generally in these pickup and delivery games, you have an open market that's available to all the players and it's kind of the economy of the game. And there is some manipulation that you can have with this. You're able to scry a card from the top or the bottom before or after you purchase a card. You're able to do that once and you're only able to buy one item from the deck. In the deck, we have these six options. So here we have cargo decks, here we have jobs, we have bounties, we have mods for your ship or gear for your character. And this is um, high value items. So they're gonna be more expensive, usually between 10 and 20,000. And they could be jobs, they could be gear, they could be mods. You know, they're, they're random, but they're not as guaranteed of what you're looking for when you buy something from this. And then the final slot is we have ships. This is where you can buy your ship. So these are this is fifteen thousand. So let's say for example, I don't I want a new ship, Han Solo, but doesn't have a lot of money. I can take this YV, this uh, this bounty hunter ship and flip the next one, and now we have a new ship. It also costs fifteen thousand dollars, and now I'd have to buy that one if I chose to do so. So that's how the scrying works. Uh, alternatively, let's say I buy this card and now I have it. The next one flips. If I don't want my opponents to be able to get this card, I could then scry that card to the bottom and have the next card revealed. So you can do that before or after you shop. So that's kind of the market manipulation. So each job potentially can have some sort of fame alignment to it. I forgot to cover one thing. At the bottom of the Han Solo card, you're gonna see that there's two uh, tech boxes. They say piloting and tech. These are your innate ability skills that you are proficient in for your character. Um, one of the things I really appreciated about this game was it felt like a very much like an old school RPG to me in terms of my skills, the type of gear I had, gearing out my ship. It just reminded me of like a classic RPG. So those skills will directly relate to say your jobs. On the job, so here we have a job, it says, rescue from the mines and it's requiring you to know knowledge stealth and strength what that means is as you complete this objective you're going to have skill based checks we're going to have to roll dice to see if you complete these requirements based on the skills that you have or crew members that you have will determine how much success you have completing these objectives 
When you start doing these, you're gonna go and grab this encounter deck, find the required card, read the text, and complete the objective. I really enjoyed the aspect of these of this deck. The thematically impressive, like deep feeling that it brought into you know what you're doing really made it feel like I was bringing me into the world. But it also depends on the people you're playing with. I did have some people I played this game with who would you know read a card like this. They grab the card and then they just pick up their dice and start rolling. And I'm like, what what are you doing? I want to know what what does your card say, you know? So we made it a rule at our table at least that you had to read the card aloud, and uh, you didn't have to, you know, have inflections in your voice. But it made it more fun to have a little bit more uh, RPG ness brought into the game. So that is one way you can get the fame. This is how the market deck works. Once you reach your point, you, you've done either jobs or bounties, you've purchased something, you can then go to your encounter step. This is the final step of the game. In the encounter step, you can encounter a patrol that might be on your territory if this patrol was over here. You might be able to uh, encounter one of these cards. At the back of all these um, planets, there are two cards that are, are kind of 50-50 split on the back side. And you just read the card that represents whatever planet you're on. For example, I'm a Nalhutta, so I'd reveal this card and I'd read Nalhutta's text and complete whatever it says. Alternatively, the cards also say what most likely you're going to face when you encounter this planet. For example, Nalhutta says I'll get credits or bounties. Uh, Mon Calamari says jobs or movement. So you have a rough idea what to expect as you encounter them. Not necessarily saying you're always going to get credits or bounties, but the vast majority of the cards in there will encounter that. The next thing you can do are these contacts that are uh, strewn throughout the galaxy. These are bounties that you could meet. These are ways that you can get additional crew. Um, and the colored references how difficult they would be to do whatever they want you to do. If they want to fight you or if they want to join your bound, your crew, how much work it may, may be. And the way you would reveal them is you would decide, okay, I'm going to encounter this guy. You'll flip them. So here we have a character, um, Zito Maj. And you'll see it has a number next to him. This one says 23. I would then find the, the card 23 in the encounter deck, read its encounter, do what it says to do, and then I'll either, you know, maybe I'll collect him as a crew, maybe he will do something to another player, whatever it may be, that's how these encounters work, and you'll leave him revealed up. Vice versa though, let's say we have taken a bounty, this is for Greedo, we know that he's a green card, so we would have to find Greedo somewhere on the planet to capture him, and you'll fight him using these dice down here, so he would roll four dice in a ground combat and then you would take him as a bounty. So that is another alternative way you can play the game. So one of the things as we wrap up here, and you know this play continues back and forth, you'll have these patrol ships that will move between the galaxy points. You're gonna have to face them, especially depending on the reputation that you have, which individual faction. And as you destroy those ships, more powerful versions will come out to the point where the final ship you might not be able to kill that ship. It's gonna kill you no matter what, so you better stay away from them. So overall, this movement will go back and forth. We found in our playthroughs at least, that the game relatively remained pretty close. We didn't have anyone that was directly super far behind, but we did have people that didn't feel like they were as um, effective in their, in their playthrough as other players were. I will say there is a massive snowball effect that certain players, depending on the type of jobs they may do, will snowball quickly and start getting a lot of money fast, or they'll just feel like they're further ahead. Doesn't necessarily mean that they're winning, but they're further ahead. So that's, that's one thing about this. So let's talk about overall, how did I feel about the game? So let's talk about theme. The theme of the game to me was very enriching, very fulfilling as a Star Wars player. It's very fulfilling for players who know the characters, 
know how they kind of interact in the universe and how the specific goals are related to those characters and and how it's kind of funny how everything kind of works out i it still plays well for someone who doesn't care for for star wars it's not a bad game i just think that there's not as much enjoyment there so i would caution anyone who's looking to buy this game that there might be better versions of games similar to this like firefly that can give you a similar experience but might not require so much depth in terms of knowing Star Wars. Overall, the components were fairly well designed and made. You'll notice that I have different colored dice here. So I have the X-Wing dice here. Now the game comes with special, I think they're world championship dice for X-Wing, which is great if you're an X-Wing player because it's a great bonus add to your collection. Um, but if you ever want to add more dice to your game, I find using X-Wing dice is cheaper and more efficient to, to add more, more stuff than it is to buy the special edition, uh, the World Championship X-Wing dice, at least from what I've seen. So that you know can be a bonus if you're an X-Wing player to be able to get the special edition dice. Otherwise, for people who... Uh, don't necessarily care about that dice, but you want to always have more dice because in a game like this It's better to have more dice, especially instead of you don't want to pass stuff everywhere all over the time um, I, I found having nine dice was the way to go and so using x-wing dice was a more cost-efficient method for me The cards are fairly uh, standard FFG cards. They are a little thin in terms of their robustness, but they have a nice linen finish they, the printing seem fine. The art is FFG Star Wars art. You'll see the same art on almost all their Star Wars games. They, they repurpose the art all the time. It's just what FFG does. I was a little disappointed when we look at some of the other ships, say the Fire Spray, they'll have an art for that. And then when you complete its personal goal, it turns into the Slave One. It's the same art on both sides. I wish they had, they have so many fire spray arts i wish they you know used a different art on the other side especially for the the named ships you know now you've got the slave one i don't have just a fire spray i have the slave one so i wish they had some additional arts for that um the cardboard uh the map came out works great i love that the the tiles are actually fully interchangeable right now i have it set up in the base game of how it wants you to set up the map but an alternative way is to shuffle all these tiles up and lay them out. Um, so it's really great that all these waypoints that they have, they look like they're really sneaking around, but I could put this tile over here and this tile over here and everything, all the waypoints will work perfectly together. So I thought that was really interesting that they, they set it up um, to work in that manner. Now with that, they do say in the rule book that Kessel, if it's over here, does affect some of the some of the aspects of the the balancing of the game uh, and this is the most balanced aspect but we found the times that we did do this the shifting around the planets it kind of made it more enjoyable because it was kind of different you didn't know you know you, normally instead of having to know where mount calamari is now it's over there and it might have to change the way you play the game um, the other thing about the cardboard though that i didn't care for the player boards came out a little warped they're a little bendy so not a huge issue bothers me might not bother you know that uh, overall though i didn't mind the components the standees instead of miniatures didn't bother me one bit some people said they would rather have had miniatures that would just cause more bloat and cost to the game i think i was totally fine with the standees so the most important part of any type of game for me are the decisions and the quality of the decisions and how do those impact the game this is a sandbox. So when you start the game, you're going to get a single card from here to kind of give you some direction of what you should do as your character. But from that point on, it's pretty open-ended. You can do literally anything. And there are times when I play with people, they, they kind of get into that uh, decision paralysis, the analysis paralysis, where like, I don't know what to do. Um, and that can happen here. The lag time in this game, the downtime, necessarily is not made from this game. I found that all the lag time was from people not 
totally knowing what they want to do on their turn as well as not knowing what was in the shop until it's their turn and then they would stare there and read every single card um so the decision making process though let's stick with that um based on the decisions i do find that you can be punished if you make a bad decision this is a game that's not forgiving if you decide to go to a planet and don't fulfill a, a task that you're meant to complete um, and the fact that a lot of the checks are are dice based you know there is a chance of uh, failing what you were trying to do and that could set you back an entire turn so know that we found that most of the games that random variability was affecting everyone so it was evenly placed throughout but if one person made a bad choice or they didn't you know weren't as efficient on their turns as they could have you can start to fall backwards i do also find that depending on the type of job you do you have a better time i think smuggling is way more cost effective and beneficial and easier to do than bounty hunting but i preferred bounty hunting it's weird. I really enjoyed Boba Fett. I enjoyed playing as his character. I liked the idea of hunting down the specific contacts. But as my opponents, especially the Han Solo player, is grabbing a cargo and flying 11 spaces to where he needs to go, you're like, my, man, I mean, it's hard to keep up. So that's one thing I felt like the balancing was a little difficult, especially with all the contacts that you're hunting for are turned down. So you, it, it takes time to land there identify who the contact is, realize it's not who you're looking for, and have to keep going. So that was one of the bad things in terms of my in terms of the decision making process is if you decide to go bounty hunting as your as your goal, you could be punished for doing so. Um, jobs worked fine. Again, I felt like these were so random based on if you were to complete them because of the dice roll, Sometimes that would be a poor decision. You're just like, well, I'm going to try doing this, this mission. I failed and now my guy's dead. So I got to spend another turn healing so I can't move anywhere. So, you know, it just can, it can compound pretty quickly. The replayability though of this game is probably the biggest knock I'm going to have on the game. I will say from playing this game, I had a ton of fun and I would recommend this game to any of my friends. But there's a limit to how many times in the base game you can play it before you feel like you've seen everything or everything that the game currently has to offer. I do believe that this game is sorely needing an expansion. And I wonder if, because it kind of feels half-baked, the amount of cards that we have in the marketplace, the amount of tokens that we can reveal, there's not a lot. In fact, when we played a four-player game, the market became so bare that there was only like two bounties left and we had, were cycling them. There was like three cargoes left, uh, very little gear, and almost all the ships had been cycled through at that point too. I mean, there was no point to buy ships. We all had high-level ships. But the fact that the bounty deck was cycled through almost entirely, the cargo deck was cycled through almost entirely, it limited the amount of stuff we could do, especially at that point we were playing to 12 fame, where most of the players were on 10 fame, and I was like, well, what do I need to do to get two more fame? I need to figure out something I can do. Um, I also find we haven't seen much uh, repeat stuff yet on these contact cards, but there's only about 10 or so cards here for each planet, and as you encounter each one, the fact that those are so few you're going to get repeats as well. The deck here, the encounter deck, you can see was clearly, it looks large, but it's not. Um, and you can see when we get to about midway, it jumps from 22, uh, maybe 23, to 40. So there's a big gap here between the numbers, and then it does another jump from 53 to 90. So clearly, there's room here for more stuff. And I suspect they're going to have more stuff. But it just makes me wonder how much bigger is this map going to be? Are they going to maybe try to connect it? Is it going to be a full circle? I don't know. I really think that the way that the map is designed is really interesting. Um, but the replayability of this game is limiting. 
I don't think you're not you're gonna get at least four solid playthroughs before you're feeling like, okay, I think I've seen everything this game has to offer in the base game. And that might be worth it, especially at the $55 that this game is released at. It might be cost efficient at that point. But I do think this is gonna need an expansion pack to truly bring out everything the Outer Rim has to offer. So overall, what would I what would I rate Outer Rim? I actually rate Outer Rim higher than what my review might sound like, but that might be because I'm biased as a Star Wars player, a fan. Um, the thematics, the way the characters are made, the RPG elements of getting your gear, getting your mods, getting your crew, you're seeing yourself building everything up. It's really fun and it's unique. I enjoyed that and it's, it's a testament to how good the game is designed that I was able to bring over two more friends when I was doing my review copies and I was playing through it. I said, hey guys, uh, let's play a four player game. You wanna come on over? And I was able to teach the game within like 10 minutes. It's a really easy teach, not a lot of complicated rules. There are nuanced rules that every fantasy flight game has, but I appreciate that they give you a rules reference alongside the learn to play. People give a hard time to fantasy flight for having two rule books. I think that's fine. Have your learn to play, which teaches you how to play the game. And then my rules reference, if I have a specific question about the meaning of what destination means, I can go to that and see destination page 11, read it, boom, easy. Um, so I really appreciated the fact that this was an easy to teach play game. Everyone was able to get the flow of it, especially after playing around. Everyone was like, oh, this makes total sense. Um, and I think it's a testament to, to how powerful and enjoyment of uh, enjoyable the game is when I was sitting there and I was like, I want more. I just wanted more. And so would I recommend Outer Rim? Yes. With the caveat that I do think it needs an expansion pack. I think you might need to be a person who enjoys Star Wars because otherwise it might be a little blank for you. But overall, I would give this my seal of approval for sure. Uh, in terms of weight complexity, I found that there are higher end rules that aren't complex, but they are there. They might need you to, they're niche situations that come up. But overall, I put this at a medium to low weight complexity. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this review. I spent a lot of time trying to find a good game and bring it to you guys here quickly. The contest, I, I forgot to mention this, we do have our giveaway currently going on still. So if you are here still for the giveaway and you want to get in your next bonus entry, leave a comment down below with the word rebel somewhere in the comment section. Also, if you are interested in what the giveaway is and if it's still active, I'll leave a card here for the Oath Sworn giveaway. Uh, that way you can see more about it. If you want to support the channel, help us out. Leave a comment down below. Make sure you smash the like button. And if you enjoyed this review, if you found this was a helpful review for you and deciding if Outer Rim might be for you, make sure you click that subscribe button and help the channel out. I'm Brian. This is Game Brigade. I will talk to you all very soon.